Good morning. Good morning, Bokir Tov. Uh, my name is Bob Raven, and I'm honored to be the MC for our symposium this morning. And uh, in a moment, I'll introduce our presenters. But first, I just want to explain what's going to happen this morning. Uh, for the uh, first uh, about half hour of the morning, we're going to hear from our esteemed speakers. And then following these presentations, we'll have some time for questions as a, as a, as a group. And um, I'll ask everybody to keep your questions brief, maybe 20 seconds or so, um, not making statements, but ask questions. Uh, so we can have as many people as possible get a chance to ask questions. Uh, the session is being videotaped. We're going to hopefully provide this uh, uh, tape on our website so we can make available what we learn together uh, to the other <coughs> members. I also encourage you to take notes because after this uh, larger session, we're going to be going to breakout sessions and we're going to discuss in a smaller group uh, ways that we can make change based on what we've been challenged with uh, this morning. Now, uh, hopefully you've gotten a card assigning you to a breakout session. Um, I'll talk about those uh, at the end. Uh, and we're just going to ask again everyone to move swiftly to those and I, I'll, I'll talk about that when I'm done. Uh, each group with, at, at the breakouts is going to have a facilitator and a recorder. And we really hope that um, at, we can provide some concrete suggestions. What we're going to do this morning is really try to provide some suggestions for change. And I've also asked our speakers to sit in a breakout session as well so that they can be a, a resource to us. <coughs> Take a look around you the next time you're in the sanctuary. And look at the faces of the men and women at prayer. Observe the intensity of the involvement, participation in the liturgy. And indeed, get a sense of how many men are in the congregation. So we were honored, we're honored to have two distinguished speakers this morning. We actually had, uh, uh, Cantor Mordecai was scheduled to join us. Um, I understand that he had a, uh, officiated a funeral today. So uh, we have two extra distinguished speakers who will uh, Will, will enlighten us and challenge us. And I'm going to admit their bios, they're in the, uh, the, the program book, uh, the list of their honors and, and, and accomplishments are extraordinary, and rather than take their time, uh, I'll refer you to, the, to them. So as they speak, let me just give you some things to think about. Do men experience God and God's wonder? Do you? Uh, if so, how? And what are the obstacles for us to have those experiences? So it's now my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Our first speaker this morning is, is Rabbi Ed Fell, who uh, became a friend of ours at our uh, New England retreat a few years ago. And uh, I'm just so thrilled to, to learn from you again today, Rabbi Fell. Thank you. So when I was asked to speak about prayer, I thought that uh, best contribution I could make would be to talk about my own prayer life and to talk about my daily davening, my daily prayer. And um, that's what I want to present this morning. I suspect that like many of you, I wake up in the morning uh, slightly disoriented. <laughs> Uh, it's that half state between dreaming and waking uh, in which I have to reassure myself where I am. I reach over, is my wife still in bed or has she gone off to her study? Um, what time is it? What day of the week? What is so pressing that I must do it today? I begin to think about what was left over from yesterday, what still must be done, what must be corrected. There are some thoughts about nice things, about um, the dinner I had last night, about a friend I had a conversation with. Frequently, there are thoughts of regret about the missed opportunities, the pressing work that didn't get done yesterday, and so the greater pile that I'll have today. And yes, 
always the agenda for today. Always the agenda. What is due? What must get done? What tasks beckon that I might go on and finish today or begin something new? I wash up, I shave, I do some back exercises, I go down to breakfast, I have my morning coffee, and I go upstairs. I put on my talit and tefillin and begin to say the morning brachot. Instantly, my reality is changed. In the forefront of my mind are different concerns than those that assail me when I first awake. Thank you for the ability to move. Thank you for the ability to see. Thank you for the clothes I have put on. Thank you for the light of the morning. Beneath it all, underneath this crescendo of thanks, is the primal thankfulness. Thank you for another day. Thank you for giving me life today. In Moscow, several years ago, I was in a taxi with the Hillel director of Moscow University, Gene Wiener. Gene had gone to Moscow just after the Soviet Union had fallen and open Jewish life was now allowed once again in Russia. His high holiday congregation at Moscow University had grown from 50 students to several hundred to 3,000. And in that third year, when thousands waited for his high holiday service, he learned that he had cancer. He went on and conducted the High Holiday Service, and then after the High Holidays, he had one lung removed. And I sat there in this taxi with him, and I asked him, what is the prognosis? And all he could say to me was, Baruch Adonai Yom Yom. Every day I pray, Thank God that I have one more day. I've learned from Jean how important <coughs> this prayer is. To have one more day. Thank you for this day. An associate of the philosopher Martin Buber once told me that Buber only prayed this one sentence. Baruch Adonai Yom Yom. Praised are you, God, for having given me one more day. And so much of the morning liturgy is a reminder of the blessing of life. But there is another side of being thankful. Being thankful means that I am aware that there is something larger than myself. I did not create myself. There is something out there. I am not the center of the universe. And there is much besides me. The tradition says that you should pray in a room which has a window. You should not pray in confined quarters. You should always realize that your prayer is meant to create a connection beyond yourself to something larger. And so I pray in the morning in front of the window of my study. I see a world full of growing trees, bushes, evergreens, I hear cars going by on side streets, people at work, and I realize that all this goes on whether or not I am here. The world goes
goes on without me. <clears throat> Maimonides describes the love and fear of God this way. When you gaze out in the world and see the complexity and the wondrousness of the world, you say to yourself, what a miracle this is. Wow. That is, says Maimonides, the love of God. And in almost the same breath, you look out at the world and realize its vastness, how small you are in comparison to the thousands of galaxies and <coughs> suns, and you step back and you shudder. That is the fear of God, says Maimonides. So it is not surprising that as I look out my window, I experience both both the wonder of existence and the indifference of the universe. What should my relationship to this universe be? This universe which does not care about me. As I say the words of the liturgy, love, ahava rabba avtanu, you have loved us with a great love. Fiahavta et Adonai Elamecha. You should love Adonai your God. What is evoked for me is the sense that I can stand in relationship to the world. That the perspective I can bring to the world is that I can relate to it. My friend, the Hebrew poet, whom Aubrey introduced me to, Admiel Kosma, constantly says to me, God is in the hyphen. That connecting line between ourselves and the world is the birthplace of God. To realize connection, to overcome distance and alienation, to make friends with that which we need. That is the way of walking through the world, which is holy. The world, as it first appears to me, appears indifferent. It goes on and does not necessarily care about my existence. <coughs> but I can establish some relationship to it. I can create a connection which is caring and loving. I may evoke something different from it. And that takes me to the third element of my morning prayer. Thoughts that are centered for me around the Amida. <coughs> if I want to stand in a relationship of love, of connection with the world, what is my obligation to it? Is there not something that I must do in order to overcome indifference? Is there not some responsibility to leave the world that I step into a better place because I've been in it? Or at least not a worse place? So I pray for the knowledge to act properly, for forgiveness of my missteps, and for the hope that I might realize something in my days which is redemptive. And then the prayer comes full circle. My prayer ends with the language of thankfulness. Thank you for the life which is in your hands, the soul which you care for, and for the miracles that, were, that are with us each and every day of our lives. And I pray for peace, a sense of balance in the world, the ability to be heard and to listen, a sense of appreciation of the goodness of life and all that is created a wonder at the difference between people and
and the unity that underlies our existence. I end my prayers trying to conjure a tune. Each day should have its own melody. And so, when I leave <coughs> off praying, I start singing. Almost always a tune without words. A tune that can capture the feelings emerging from my prayer today. My path to daily prayer was not easy or straightforward. I began by sitting in the morning and just reading some inspiring liter literature to start off my day. I taught myself Hebrew calligraphy and wrote out one prayer of the liturgy at a time, sometimes choosing a psalm that had not been part of the traditional liturgy, sometimes writing my own prayer, always making sure that what I wrote is what I could honestly say. Gradually, a daily siddur emerged, a loose-leaf siddur with words and pictures of my own compilation. The lines of each page represented the single thought that my mind could encompass. Once I was on a flight to Israel and joined the Orthodox crowd at the back of the plane as the sun rose in the east. I davened out of my loose-leaf siddur, and one of the black-coated congregation turned to me and asked, are you a refusenik? He had assumed that since I had a loose-leaf siddur, that I was a Russian Jew who had copied my own prayer book from Samizdat because printed texts were unavailable. <laughs> I like that image of myself thinking of myself as a refusenik, having to learn everything from scratch, having eked out my own religious life. Thank you. It's an honor to be here with you and especially with my good friend Ed because we've shared so much of a journey together relating to prayer. And I'm going to make a few claims this morning that you may disagree with, but I think that's part of the purpose of prayer. I hope that you have the handouts. We began the journey of prayer this morning with a wonderful celebratory minyan here. If you don't have them, please avail yourselves, especially of the collection that is called Kumi Roni Noshke Rumi, Arise, Exalt, Lovers of Rumi. I'll explain to you what that's about, but I actually want to share a few experiences from my own personal prayer life and the struggle that I've had with, with daily prayer. And as Ed has taught us, it's never a straightforward path, it's always uh, a circuitous route. The first thing I'm going to share with you comes from one of the most important books that I discovered about prayer. We have very few of them, I believe, that really take prayer seriously from the tradition, and that's part of the project that I'm engaged in uh, over many years now. It's called The Pillar of Prayer, Amud Hatfilah, written by the Baal Shem Tov. Many of you have heard of the Baal Shem Tov before, the master of the good name Israel, Ben Eliezer, Sarah Baal Shem Tov. He understood, and his disciples understood, that prayer is so profoundly important that it's a matter of life and death. One of his students, Pinchas of Koretz, says the following, Ha-tfilah hi ha-elohut. Translated roughly as, prayer is not about God. Prayer is God. Ha-tfilah hi Part of the problem, or the problems that we experience in prayer together, 
is that we think too much. I love to think. Ed loves to think. Many of us love to think. But thinking really is not sufficient to enter into the world of prayer. Conservative Judaism has prided itself on its scholarship and its thinking, but we have been bereft for so long of feeling what prayer is about. And for example, one of the, the ways that I enter into prayer that I think is really profoundly important, if we had the rest of our service here together, I would, as is my custom in the morning, I put on two sets of tefillin. I'm not going to go into all the reasons why that happens, but I'll tell you my interpretation of, of why that I do that. The tefillin, the phylacteries of Rashi and Rabbein Yitam. Why do I do that? Because we say zecher l'machlokeres. Because we try to remember a controversy. The truth is, is that we don't know whether the scrolls inside of the tefillin are supposed to be as they appear in the Torah, uh, Rashi, or Rabbein Yitam, whether they should be chronological. Uh, chronological or thematic. There's two different ways of ordering the scrolls that are written inside the phylacteries. And the truth is, is that in the end of the day, just like with the mezuzah, we don't know. Right? We don't know. And so how do we put the mezuzah on the door? Which direction is the point? The we don't know direction. Right. Some say like this, some say like this. We don't know. I start my day of prayer in the place of not knowing. That's one of the most important things to begin because if prayer is not about God, but prayer is God, then I have to start from the place of actually understanding that I don't know, that I'm not here to begin to think about God, I'm here to encounter what it is that I don't know. One of the ways that I connect to that place of unknowing is through, as Ed had mentioned, through poetry, through Hebrew poetry being written in Israel. In this recent collection called Mystical Vertigo, Ed actually just came back from Israel and he got to Daven with one of my favorite poets and one of the great leaders and visionaries of our movement in Israel, Tamar uh, Eldad Applebaum. And she has a beautiful poem here, and I just want to read one uh, line from it, and it'll resonate because it's an opening morning prayer. See if you can remember where this comes from in our morning prayers. She starts off, Baleilot, Rabba Emunatecha. At night, or in the evenings, your faith is greater. Does anyone remember where that comes from? Those, those two words of Rabbi Emunatecha? In the early morning prayers. Before Ezra hmm? Much earlier. All right, we say, that's right. The prayer of gratitude that we start with is Modani Lefanecha. Thank you, God, for restoring the soul into me. You have done this with this great sense of love. Great is your faith. That's the morning moment into which we arise. And Tamar says, it's not the morning light in which we find faith, but it's in the evening. It's in the dark nights of our souls. So I want to begin part of an experience together. Turn to page five please, in your booklets. And if we take what Tamar says seriously, and we take what Pinchas of Karet said seriously, that prayer is not about God, prayer is the encounter of God. And it happens in the dark nights of our souls, in the places of unknowing, uncertainty, the places where we cannot be for sure that there is God and where God is. We could say that after Auschwitz, it's a gamble, but it's a gamble that we have to take. Number three. It's a gamble that we have to take. And on page five, I invite you to come and join me on this gamble for love. Page five. Gamble everything for love if you're a true human being. If not, leave this gathering. Half-heartedness doesn't reach into majesty. You set out to find God, but then you keep stopping for long periods at mean-spirited roadhouses. Don't wait any longer. Dive in the ocean. Leave and let the sea be you. Silent, absent, walking an empty road. All praise. Shh. 
שיהיו למשפחה על אל וזמרה, עוז וממשלה, נצח גדולה וגבורה, תהילה ותפארת קדושה ומלכות, ברכות והודעות מעתה ועד עולם, אל חי העולמים. Do you recognize where we are, where we've taken the journey to? It's amazing. One of the things that happens when we focus on music as part of the journey of prayer is that we can transport ourselves. The instruments that we're listening to now come from Turkey. The Turkish Jew Jewish experience was one that was very rich. It's part of what I talk about here in the book. And why it's so interesting is the two instruments you're listening to now the Persian flute is called a ney. You hear it? And the drum is called the daf, or the tof. These two instruments take us on a profound journey. And in the time of the Baal Shem Tov, the second half of the 17th century, we know that Jewish poets and composers became close to Muslim and Christian musicians in their places of worship, and specifically, through to this day, Turkish Sufi poetry uh, exerts a profound influence on part of our own liturgical journey. We have a story as well, a powerful story of Avtalion ben Mordechai, who was constantly present in the monastery of the dervishes, the Mevlevi dervishes in Turkey, where he would join them on Friday afternoon in song and dance around the sounds of these musical instruments. So what I'm suggesting, and I'm now going to share with you part of that personal journey, is that in order for prayer to be able to be alive, we have to acknowledge the places where we feel that, as in the translation here of the poetry from a Turkish poet named Jalaluddin Rumi, there are places where prayer for us can be silent and can be absent of the presence of God. That's the first step of not knowing. It's the dark night of the soul. We have to acknowledge that we struggle to encounter God. And that was something that I struggled with for a long time, especially when I was studying in the seminary at JTS, where Ed was a rabbi in residence after I was there. I wish he was there when I was there. But I ended up traveling to every single minyan on the Upper West Side. I found a lot of powerful inspiration in prayer, especially with Rachel Makarlabach. But I also journeyed beyond the walls of Judaism, and I made my way up to Chestnut Ridge to a small darga, a small house of prayer, where the Turkish Sufis pray, and I met Sheikh Tosem Bayrik al Jarari al Halveti. I met him both in Toronto and then I met him in Chestnut Ridge, and I was introduced to these sounds. And it challenged me because these sounds are used in traditional Sufi prayer, the Muslim mystical path. These uh, sounds are used for a prayer that's called Zikr, the prayer of remembering God, remembering God in our lives. And I found that for one of the first times uh, in my life as a rabbinical student, I, when I prayed with them, that I was actually experiencing prayer on a much deeper level than I'd ever experienced it. And so my challenge was to remain Jewish, to come back to my Jewish prayer and to begin infusing it with this shared experience that came from Turkey. And I began to explore the Turkish Jewish roots of these prayers. Part of what was so powerful about it was the sense that there was a journey that we go on together. And prayer for it to be uh, efficacious needs to have a sense of a journey. I want to turn to page 9 for the next step in this journey together. And I invite you to read with me in the English. I want to explain why these translations in English are so important and where I discovered them. I don't know if any of you know who Coleman Barks is. He's a very famous poet and American uh, poet and translator. And he has taken the words of Rumi and put them onto the bestseller list. So these come from many different collections of his. I experienced them as a seminary student 
when I went to New Jersey to the Dodge Poetry Festival to hear Coleman read this poetry. And as he did it one morning out in a tent, I had my tefillin on and listened to Coleman with his southern twang read this remarkable poetry. And I realized something transformative was happening. And so part of this project that I've begun experimenting with in my own prayer practice is to take snippets, you'll notice on top of each page, there's small phrases that come from liturgy and from prayer. And I like to bring them into conversation with this moment of the journey down the Silk Road in Turkey to see what I can discover uh, about the depth of my own prayer practice in relationship to the prayer and the sounds of another great mystic. So let's read together about spiritual window shopping because this is one of the dangers, but it's also one of the important things for us to be able to do because if we don't look outside of our own camp, we can never make prayer truly come alive. Page nine, let's read together. Purify me from spiritual window shopping. These spiritual window shoppers who idly ask, how much is that? Oh, I'm just looking. They handle a hundred items and put them down. Shadow with no capital. What is spent is love and two eyes wet with weeping. But these walk into a shop and their whole lives pass suddenly in that moment, in that shop. Where did you go? Nowhere. What did you have to eat? Nothing much. Even if you don't know what you want, buy something to be part of the general exchange. Start a huge foolish project like Noah. Build an ark. Be a tzaddik in palace. It makes absolutely no difference what people think of you. One of the difficult things, I'm going to close my remarks in just a few moments, is to understand really what it is that we mean when we talk about prayer. What's the word for prayer in Hebrew? Tilah. I like to translate it not as prayer, but if you look on page 12, as being alone. If you look back into the Hebrew Bible, the root of tefillah, suggested by some etymologists, is palal, pelam, and lamed, which means to be alone. Tila is a time to be alone with God, together with others. So as we turn to page 12, I want to take what Pinchas of Koret said earlier in a very serious way. This is a life and death question for us in our lives, that if we don't engage in prayer as the possibility of evoking God, then God does not exist. Prayer is not about God. Prayer is God. Number eight on page 12, alone, tefillah, is more than imagination. Please join me. This we have now is not imagination. This is not grief or joy, not a judging state, or an elation or sadness. These come and go. This is the presence that doesn't. It's dawn, my friend. Here in the splendor of coral inside the friend, in the simple truth of what David Hanabi said, Ani, Shalom. What else could human beings want? When grapes turn to wine, they're wanting this. When the night sky pours by, it's really a crowd of beggars, and they all want some of this. This, that we are now, created the body, cell by cell, like bees building a honeycomb. The human body in the universe grew from this, not this, from the universe and the human body. Levado hameshubach vehamefua vehamid naser mimatola. The 
The final thing that I want to share with you as an experience are three words of liturgy. I don't have them here, but here are the words. They come from Tanakh as well. Repeat after me, Ein, Ein. Od, Od. Milvado. Milvado. If we have problems with prayer, which all of us do, I've suggested today it's because we think too much. The Baal Shem Tov teaches the purpose of knowing and all of the knowledge that we accumulate is to understand and to realize that we know nothing. The beginning of prayer is that moment of unknowing. How do we allow ourselves the comfort and the possibility of not knowing, of not being master of everything that we see on our iPads and on our computers and all the technology that we have to say, I just don't know, I can't look it up on Google is to say these words, Ein od, Milvado. There is nothing alone except for the one, this, coursing through the universe. So join me now with these words as a way of closing this experience, this journey of prayer that began with the possibility that prayer is not about God, but prayer is God. Jewish men into crossroads. And one of the crossroads we felt was, was our prayer lives. Uh, I wrote a, a piece uh, in CJ Magazine a number of years ago, and I started off by saying, uh, I quoted the, uh, well, I, I, I paraphrased the movie Network, where I said, uh, services are so boring I can't take it anymore. Um, and I think what's happened uh, is if you look around the sanctuaries, I challenged you in my introductory remarks, um, our sanctuaries are, are becoming empty. They're becoming empty of people, and when the people are there, they're, become, they're people that really aren't there. And, and so that we need to think about ways to, to revitalize that. We, we've had some amazing, uh, thought-provoking um, um, emotions this morning. And I think the, the challenge now is to, to think about ways that we can um, take what we've heard and uh, translate them into action, so to speak. And action for ourselves as individuals, but also an action in our communities, as leaders in our communities, as uh, Barry Shrake uh, challenged us last night to go back and, and ask what our communities, what kind of communities we want to be a part of. Um, we're going to break out into break, we're going to break into breakout sessions in just a few minutes. Um, it's a little easier to discuss this um, in smaller groups rather than in the large group that we're in now. 
But before we do, um, I'd like to just um, invite anybody who'd like to ask a question with, with in front of the large group uh, um, to do so, and uh, maybe just come up and uh, sort of stand up and just speak loudly. So, and I'll I'll repeat the question if, if everyone doesn't hear. Good. Um, I, I was just curious when you said you put on two to fill in, um, physically, how do you do it? So how do you put on two sets of fill? It's a, great, it's a great question. Some of them are actually constructed. I've seen where they're actually attached together. Uh, Trilin Shalrosh is actually two of them fused as one. But basically, one of the things that we did this morning in our prayer service, what's your name? Uh, Rob. Were you here this morning, Rob? No. I thought you were, okay, sorry. But the, um, the stations of prayer that we went through this morning, which we didn't get a chance to taste yet in this session, um, show a journey. So there's basically five stations, four stations of prayer. And for your Kodoshah, Herb Suke, the Zimra, Shema, and some say the Amidah, that's the first set of tefillin. So somewhere between the end of the Amidah and the repetition, there's a chance to move into the second set. And that also follows that journey of, uh, of not necessarily knowing, right? So that we leave the service and we leave the morning, as I said to you earlier, um, in a place of humility, in a place of not knowing. And so what results from that, this is what I, I teach a lot of my students in relationship to this, is that if we do not know, then the blessing we also say in the morning, um, Torah, to struggle with the meaning of Torah, it's an invitation to make the day an experience of beginning to know again. Right? To learn, because we don't know. Yep. I clearly see the, the need, again, for integrating both the intellectual and the spiritual and, and the practical problem of getting it. People are not in the services, people are not engaged in the services. What sort of, when you're looking at trying to change things to add music, to add other ways of looking at it, how do you, how do you think, how do you, what have you seen that works and doesn't work between, on the one hand, something interesting to get him in, and the problem of Mrs. Kellerman wants to rain Callahan with the same way she's always had a rain Callahan. So, uh, good people, you, you want to get something different, and that drive, and that can drive people out just when you're trying to bring them in. So, how do you balance? How do you balance innovation and uh, tradition, and, and how do you make the, the regulars happy and and, uh, and still bring in some of these um, um, traditions that that most of us um, just are uh, are new to us. What I was trying to say in, in uh, the talk was that um, I think the first question to ask is, do people really want a life of prayer? Um, if, if um, I don't want to denigrate anything, but it, and singing communally can be a very important vehicle for being able to raise the spirit. But if the whole purpose of coming to synagogue is to sing some old songs together, which we all know, um, what's missing is uh, a real yearning to pray. And the starting point has to be that that sense of wanting to pray and and um, and it involves at least two things uh, I think both I and Aubrey touched on this and I think it has to do in part with this question of why are there fewer men in the liberal synagogue I think that one of the things that prayer demands and I um, is a sense of humility that I don't fill the universe, that my wants are not everything in the universe, and that I can in fact laugh at all the things that I want so much. And um, I was thinking as you were talking, Aubrey, uh, there's a wonderful story of the Dalai Lama, of his um, riding through Los Angeles and seeing an electronics store. And um, he said as he rode by the electronics store, he so much wanted what he saw in the window. 
And then he said to himself, but I don't even know what it does. <laughs> you know? um, how many things do we want in that kind of way? You know? and, and to realize that um, the wanting more, the wanting more, uh, uh, how do, you know, what I want to do is want less. And so to start, to walk into a prayer service with a sense of humility, to walk into a prayer service with wanting to be instructed, wanting to get something out of this, wanting, I, I, I come to the service because I know my lack, because I know what I don't have. I, I know that my soul thirsts and I'm not being fulfilled. And if one begins with those feelings, then I think one is willing to be instructed. But that's about wanting to pray. I, I think when I'm, oh, okay, well, I'm, I'm, gonna, yeah. I'm gonna stop the questions after this. Yeah, well, listen, I won't just pick up on what Ed said, because what's your name? Stuart. Stuart asked a great question. Um, and I'm gonna show you practically, because everyone here is very tactless and concerned about concrete steps. What to do about Mrs. Kellerman? Because I deal with Mrs. Kellermans all the time in my community who wants Ain Kellohanan. Okay, what are the words for Ain Kellohanan? Everybody knows it. Let me hear them. Ain Kellohanan. Ain Kadonanu. Ain Kemokanan. Ain Kemoshianan. Okay, now repeat after me. spent about 10 minutes doing that, we could transport ourselves. It's the cheapest way to get a one-way ticket to Istanbul um, through our the imaginations and the imaginal forms of prayer. The point is, is that there is so much that we can do with the existing words of liturgy if we are able to open ourselves, Mrs. Kellerman, to the possibility that the whole service will be all of our familiar tunes, but once a week, once a month, whatever it is, we're going to try to really go into the journey of the words of Ein for example. And that means a couple things. It means that you, as lay leaders, have to be supportive and ready to create an environment of journeying and experimentation within the traditional Matmeya of Tefillah to support and to go to your chazanim and to say, and to your clergy, we want to go on a musical journey. This month, this Shabbat, is it's a Shabbat in Turkey. And we're going to have, uh, you know, kebab and baklava at the end of services. Everyone dress up in your, your famous or whatever garbs, your jalabiya, what, whatever it is that you know that comes from Turkey. Make it a, a themed event. This is, a, this is Turkish Shabbat. And we're going to do this uh, Turkish in Kelahenu. And next month, we're going to go to Spain. And we're going to have tapas and wine at, uh, at services afterwards. And then maybe we'll do a different Adon Olam because even Gabi wrote Spanish, who wrote Adon Olam, and we'll experience something from the Sephardic tradition. So there's ways of doing it and of marketing and branding what we do, where we can take people on a journey of the rich uh, ethnic tapestry that is interwoven through our Jewish cultures of dispersion. And throughout the course of a year, you could take eight to 10 journeys, do missions where you don't have to leave your synagogue, and you can actually do them through prayer. I want to leave on one happy note. Please. Um, with my first, uh, uh, quote, congregation, I was the whole director at the University of Illinois, and I led high holiday services, and a woman came up to me and said, that's the first time in 17 years that I've been in the synagogue that I haven't been bored. bored. And I... Uh, when I looked at her and I made in amazement, and I thought to myself, how wonderful Jews are. They'll come for 17 years and be bored and still hope that something will happen. Uh, the Messiah is coming. Thank you. Amen.